Okay, welcome everyone. Come in, come in. Welcome to those of you here in the room and those of you online. What session are you in? You can see the title on the screen. So this session is Data Strategies Sharing Challenges, Plans, and Priorities Across Federal Agencies. My name is Leslie Shi. I'm at the US Geological Survey, and my co-convener is Megan Carter Orlando from ESIP that you can see over there. Okay, notes. So there is a Google Notes doc that is linkable from the sketch. We will also show a tiny URL soon. Um, so it would be great if you could go into the note stock and log your name. Remember the ESIP community participation guidelines as we have the discussion here today. A note that we are recording this session, so just be aware of that. If you are on Zoom, welcome. Please check your audio at your mic and your camera and we invite our speakers to share their mic and camera just make sure if you want to be muted you're muted i would like to thank our esip fellow kyla richards who is here in the front helping with av um, if there's any problems i'll be running to kyla and just a note that for the Q&A at today's sessions, we do have a lot of speakers, so we would appreciate if you could use the Q&A tab in slido.com. The code is ESIPDS for data strategy, and that way we can try to keep track of the questions and which ones are upvoted most. I will do my best to keep us on time which means that we should proceed. Okay, also you see the slide up there, there is a welcome poll that should be going right now. You can feel free to answer that short welcome poll so we can take a look at who's in the room and who's on Zoom with us and set a little bit of a baseline there. What are we discussing today? We will have a very brief introduction to um, the federal data strategy and some related documents and agency strategies. Uh, the presentations from five different agencies, I believe. And then I'm hoping we have time to think about what does this mean for you and next steps? Because honestly, that's why Megan and I were interested in having this session because we kind of saw these strategies being developed and like this, this is going to affect us, but how is it going to affect us? So that would be nice if we all came away knowing a little bit more about how they will affect us. Okay, so as a reminder, if you haven't gone to Slido, we do love seeing a little bit more about who is in the room. In fact, I will attempt to see if we can see any uh, results here. So let's see, let's say. Okay, so um, are people on Zoom seeing these results? Yes? Okay, we still have some. Oh, I know why. Probably because it doesn't say show results. You pull re hmm. If you show that screen, that works. I can show this. This, yeah. this always trips me up. I'm sorry about that. Show results. This is really, okay. So just to get a little bit of knowing who's in the room, you are here to learn. I'm here to learn as well, but it looks like of those of you who have responded, about half of us are familiar with the federal data strategy. Again, about half with maybe agency strategies you're involved with. Then we also have public access plans and some OSTP memos that go by nicknames, Nelson Memo and Holdren Memo, that maybe some of you will learn a bit more about today. And this is very tricky to try to do this on the presenting screen. I'm sorry about that. 
Hide. What do I want to hide, Kyla? Hmm? Thank you. All right, and we'll just go to the second one. And how much do you think you will be affected by these federal data strategies? Over half of the respondents say a lot. It affects my daily job. And then some a little. And this blue is I'm not sure. And maybe a couple of people, not at all. OK, that's very interesting. So good. We think it's going to affect us. So let's learn a bit more about them. So I have about like two sentences on each of those things. And this is just a brief setting. So we all know what these different policy uh, documents are. The federal data strategy, you can learn more about it at strategy.data.gov. And this encompasses a 10 year vision for how the federal government will accelerate the use of data to deliver on mission, serve the public and steward resources while protecting security, privacy and confidentiality. One thing that um, I like to think about is this is not just scientific data. This is like all federal data. So this is very broad. It's a 10 year vision and you can see some of the agency actions that were in their action plan. But a lot of us are thinking about science data. So, so what affects that? That's where we get to these two Office of Science and Technology Policy memos, the first of which came out in 2013, nicknamed the Holdren Memo, which developed a plan to support increased public access to the results of research funded by the federal government. Um, you can either go to the link or in the folder for this meeting session. Um, it's also downloaded there in the resources folder. And more recently in 2022, the scope of that memo was expanded with the Nelson memo to add additional agencies and data. The public access plans that you may have heard of were developed and updated as a result of those two memos from the last slide. And this on the right, you can just see there's a whole bunch of public access plans that were developed as a result of that 2013 memo and they're being updated now. So if you're like, what is public access plan data strategy? This is a little bit of the connections and relationships between them. And then finally, what we will hear a lot more about today is agency that agency data strategies developed to meet the goals of the previous documents. But the requirement for a formal agency data strategy varies across departments. So USGS is part of Department of the Interior. They were all told make a data strategy, but we're going to see I'm from USGS. I don't know what the other agencies were told, and that's what we will learn more about today. So I'm very happy that our invited speakers from USGS, USDA, EPA, NASA, and NOAA are going to come and give us an overview of what's going on with their data strategies. I'm, we have a mix of a couple of virtual presenters and other in-person presenters, and I'm going to do my very best to stand up right next to you after about eight minutes so we can get to all of the speakers and also get to a bit more discussion afterwards. Okay, it's not discussion yet. So with that, I'm going to invite Viv Hutchison from the USGS to share her screen. It's Viv's sharing screen face. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. I'm going to try to make this full screen, which I, is going to be very challenging for me. Did I get it right, Leslie? Let's see. I think, is this a acceptable view for you here in the room? And we can hear you. It's full screen, so I think Please go ahead, Viv. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks, Leslie, and thanks to everyone that's at ESIP. I hope everyone's having a wonderful ESIP this week. Uh, the agenda is amazing. 
Um, so my name is Viv Hutchison. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey and have recently moved into a role called the USGS Senior Data Advisor. Um, so I work directly with and for the Associate Chief Data Officer of USGS. Uh, her name is Cheryl Morris. Um, and just in relation to the data strategy for USGS that we have most just recently put together, um, I did lead a writing team to help develop that and communicate it across the Bureau, and um, we're in the process of publishing it. So I'll talk through a little bit of that here as we go along. Uh, but just to take a step back and look at what is the USGS providing in terms of data itself, um, the scientific research at USGS is based on sort of a multidisciplinary approach to studying the Earth and its biology. Um, it's, we are geographically distributed across the country, so we have a wide variety of data collection and management techniques, formats and sizes and integration needs amongst our data. Uh, so the distributed approach presents some challenges, but also a lot of opportunity. Uh, and we have a lot of customers of USGS data that includes other DOI bureaus and federal agencies, uh, state agencies, academia, industry, and the public. And um, with all that, um, you know, because we have this sort of diverse range of unique uh, data sets and also very large and standardized data, um, and so a policy of sorts requires, our policy in USGS, sorry, requires a lot of robust review, approval, and release process. It takes a lot of time for scientists uh, to complete this. So kind of one of the challenges that USGS faces as we uh, try to release high quality data um, each time. We, we produce a really large data sets so that pr poses some challenges in terms of long-term storage and preservation and movement across networks and the cloud and so forth. And so there's a lot of also multi multiple evolving programs out there for serving data in the USGS. And so sometimes consistency of data management processes across our publishing scientists is a bit of a challenge. Okay, so in terms of the USGS data strategy, um, USGS has a really long history, I would say, of data management and release of scientific data. And the strategy builds on existing tools that we have in the Bureau, best practices we've come up with and policies that we have in place, just to ensure that USGS continues to, this is to, con to continue to modernize and advance its data capabilities and streamline processes for uh, consistency and efficiencies in data management. And the strategy was drafted by the USGS Data Advisory Board, a fairly new group that was formed in 2022 last year. It's led by the Associate Chief Data Officer as well as the Associate Chief Information Officer and the Associate Director of Office of Budget Planning and Integration. Uh, so those three co-lead this data advisory board and each member of what we call the DAB, data advisory board, represents uh, sort of a different area of USGS. So, uh, so regions that include all of our science centers, uh, major offices and that type of thing. Um, and so the DAB established this writing team to draft and communicate and publish the USGS data strategy. And we shared it with a lot of influential groups across the bureau. Um, such as the USGS executive leadership team, our council on senior scientists, uh, the community for data integration and so forth. There were a number of groups that uh, we consulted with to make the, the strategy uh, even better. We asked them questions about the goals and objectives and how best to implement the plan. Um, and right now we're in the publication process at USGS and it'll be shared broadly uh, once it's published, for sure, it's being shared internally as we speak now, and we're developing an implementation plan. We're trying to prioritize into smaller chunks, smaller tasks, and identify groups to help work on those things. Okay, um, the data strategy is, the goals are really high level. We see this as a decadal vision. Um, it all includes promoting data innovation, uh, maximizing the utility of USGS data by understanding our stakeholder needs, um, ensuring that we're releasing fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, 
uh, better coordinating our data practices across the Bureau uh, and modernizing our enterprise data ar architecture and then enhancing our data centric culture at USGS. So those are just the a snippet of the major goals that are outlined there. Each goal is accompanied by several more uh, detailed objectives as well. Um, and in addition, the data strategy is intrinsically linked with the Office of Chief Information Officer. Um, they have an information management and technology strategy and one of the goals um, around data architecture directly overlaps with that strategy uh, on purpose. I'll put up a few related sites. Hopefully these will be shared slides so you can have access to those, but these are some other related USGS sites to the USGS data strategy that might be of interest. Um, our data management website has been around for a number of years, kind of a pretty robust, uh, publicly accessible site. Um, some of our best practices are in there and linked to policy as well. The survey manual is our policies. We have four data management related policies. And then the next few links there are um, some catalogs and repositories of USGS data describing those more. And then lastly here, uh, just in summary, so we are moving that data strategy into the implementation phase. Um, it's being, that implementation is being led by the data advisory board. Um, and the strategy is in our science publishing network queue uh, to be published as a USGS circular. So hopefully uh, out in the fall of this year, uh, we'll see. And then I was asked to put a question for other panelists. And so that for that, I came up with, um, what steps did other agencies take in starting implementation and how are you prioritizing and monitoring effectiveness of the implementation of your data strategies? So Leslie, that is all I have today. Thank you so much, Viv. Um, Viv, will you be able to be on the session until the end? Yes, okay. I'll be here. So we are going to save the questions for the end. Again, if there's one you wanna jot down, you can go ahead and put it in the Slido. We'll figure out how to use Slido after all the presentations. And I would like to invite our next speaker, Cindy Parr from the US Department of Agriculture Research Education. She is a Research Education and Economics Assistant Chief Data Officer. Just one moment, I need to share our screen. Sorry. Do you want to hide the bar? Can we check that the sure. space bar works? You can check it. Um, I only know how to do it in Chrome. We're very. What did you say? Check Chrome. Yes. Wait, so can't we just oh, use? Okay. Arrows? Yeah. Sure. All right, thanks for your patience with the technology. Um, so my name is Cindy Parr. As uh, Leslie said, I'm the Assistant Chief Data Officer for this mission area, and I will go into what that means on another slide. Um, in addition to being a, one of the eight Chief Data Officers in USDA, I also serve in the National Agricultural Library. So my CDO hat has to do with the Evidence Act, if you're familiar with that. And my National Ag Library services are all on public access. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about both because in USDA, we are treating them uh, sort of uh, together. Um, the first question with USDA is always, what do we mean by agency? So unlike commerce, it sounds like uh, we have done things policy-wise at the whole department level, even though our department has 16 component agencies. And so that's pretty complex. For the Evidence Act purposes, they've created uh, chief data officer positions for each of the eight mission areas. My mission area is all about research. So the agencies that I serve are the Agricultural Research Service, 2,000 in-house researchers, 
the Economic Research Service and the National Ag Statistics Services. Those two are both statistics agencies. And then finally, NIFA, which is our extramural funding agency, and the Office of the Chief Scientist that coordinates research across the entire department. So I was asked at lunch, does USDA fund research? And if you add all of this up and include some of the research outside of this mission area, it comes up to about $4 billion. So the answer is yes. A lot of it is in-house, and that has its own you know, pros and cons, and a lot of it is external. So the Evidence Act stuff is primarily focusing on what we do internally, whereas the public access is a combination of internal and external. Um, so I apologize in advance if, if I might um, make things more confusing for you. So the question is, what data do we share? So in my mission area, the span of domains ranges from uh, life sciences. We do a lot of genomics research. Uh, we do physiology, um, nutrition, environmental data, which I, I know is the focus mostly here. But then we also have socioeconomic and marketing data because, again, of our interest in statistics and, and providing data for decision making about the economics of agriculture. Um, and then finally, we have what I call program data, which is um, portfolio information. Wh where do we spend our money on research? And I'm also uh, keenly interested in that. If you think about data types, we have a lot of geospatial data. We have a lot of imagery, both sort of what you might think of as geospatial imagery, but also microscopy images or crop images uh, for machine learning, that sort of thing. Um, tabular data, obviously, and then we do a lot of modeling. Um, the Ag Data Commons is, uh, oh, and I, unfortunately, the URL is cut off here, but you'll see it again at the end. Um, this is our general data repository that we're providing at the library for use by our community, but it's not the only place where our ag data goes. Who are our customers? Well, obviously we're serving researchers around the world, um, but we also serve the extension service, which every state has some capacity for. It's funded by NIFA in large part uh, through the states. We also serve other USDA agencies as evaluators. Um, we serve growers, we, we serve people who buy food and look at those nutrition facts on the labels. Um, and we also provide data that small businesses pick up and use in their own products. So it's a pretty diverse customer base. Um, I have a long list of challenges for data sharing, uh, and I'm really only going to focus on a few of them because a lot of these are not unique or distinct, but the ones that are coming to mind, particularly for me at this meeting, is that we're constantly asked, how should we share our data, our research data, for this domain or that domain, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. That's what our in-house people say, but who's gonna decide what those best practices are? So we're, we're in the process of trying to figure out how to do that, and I'm excited that here, uh, it looks like at the unconference uh, later tomorrow, we might actually have a crowdsourcing approach to this, which I think would be fantastic. Um, we have a lot of data that are in active databases that are constantly being updated. We also have a desire to make sure everything has DOIs and are properly housed in a long-term repository. So that's kind of a tension. Um, although the Nelson memo and the Holdren memo don't require sharing of code or uh, software, we know that it's important. And as we're thinking about doing our policies, we might think about including those things, certainly recommending that those be published along with the research data. Uh, and then finally, impact. We wanna make sure that our data has impact and I've mentioned here a dashboard that NAS has created that um, uses some machine learning approaches to try to measure how much impact their very large, very popular data sets are having. Okay, strategy. So this is a tough question for me too. So which of the strategies do we wanna talk about? So on the left here is our over, overall departmental strategy at large, everything that we do. And in that strategy, data is a core value particularly in the research context. We base our decisions and policy on science and data that are reliable, timely, relevant, and free from political interference. So we take this seriously in my mission area and everything that we do for data is in support of that mission. Um, on the right side, you can see the science and research strategy. This was just launched in May. And again, data is woven throughout it. And uh, I was very successful in getting open science included as, as a piece of that overall research data strategy. So um, it's exciting. We're just getting started to implement this new research strategy. Okay, as far as data strategies, we have a departmental data strategy on the left, and we have a mission area data strategy on the right. 
And both of these are currently under revision and not really available yet for you guys to see. So I'm sort of giving you a preview of what I'm pivoting to for our mission area for our data strategy. Um, oh, and then the uh, Nelson memo uh, was mentioned earlier. We have an implementation plan to increase uh, equitable access to our publications and data. That has been cleared, but isn't yet pretty enough to share. So unfortunately, I can't provide a link to that yet, but hopefully next week, I'm hoping. Okay, so the process for our data strategy, the first time around, the department just handed us a template and said, here, make a data strategy. These are, these are the buckets. Um, I have a data governance advisory board in my mission area that I run, has representatives from all the agencies in the group that I serve. Um, we had consultation with data stewards and we had our steering committee approve it. This time around, we were doing it a little more um, over a longer period of time with consultation. Um, we had a couple workshops on research portfolio analysis. We did an exercise with Gartner to get a sense of our maturity as far as data and analytics. Um, we have the new data strategy to align to, and then the research and science strategy is also going to play into this. Um, external consultations, I'm counting this as an external consultation, so I'd love to get feedback. Um, and then we'll continue to do internal consultations, and then finally our governance board will approve it, hopefully in the next month or two. The main points is not too different actually from what I saw from USGS. So the first point, the first goal is about governance and stewardship to increase our coordination on things like standards, data quality, cataloging on those priority topics. Um, the second one is about workforce. We need to scale what we do for data to invest in and support our data workforce. Of course, we're a research mission area. Everybody has expertise in data, but they don't necessarily have expertise in, in management of data. They might be great on analytics, but in a very siloed way and uh, not necessarily in more advanced analytics. Um, enterprise systems, we have the same goal that USGS does. We, we're trying to drive people to use shared platforms. Um, we, number four is about effective data and code sharing, both with our other USDA agencies, it's actually difficult within, um, as well as with external stakeholders. And then finally, we've added this new one having to do with artificial intelligence R&D capacity, because that's going to be an area of focus, and we should be leading that from our mission area for the department. All right, and there's the links, um, and that's all I have. Thanks. I would like to invite Jeff Hollister from the EPA to introduce our next virtual speaker. Hello all, so uh, my name's uh, Jeff Hollister. I'm a research ecologist uh, with uh, EPA's Office of Research and Development. And obviously I'm the one here in Burlington, but I'm not the right one to be speaking about the agency level uh, data strategy. Um, and so I do get to introduce uh, Ann Vega. Uh, Ann is also with Office of Research and Development, but with the uh, Office of Scientific Information Management. Um, she's been working with uh, EPA for quite a while on uh, open source software and uh, open access, um, but she very recently was uh, has been moved into a position uh, as ORD's uh, data architect. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Anne. And if there's any questions later, I'm here to answer them, but I'll probably end up just passing it off to Anne anyway. So Anne, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Um, while I get set up here, Pick the right screen to share. I am going to turn off my camera while I'm presenting. I tend to have issues when I'm uh, on video and presenting at the same time. So, okay. Good? That's great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're going from um, USDA, uh, amazingly um, uh, well thought out strategy and, and uh, a, a really large agency compared to, to EPA. And, and we're not even going to look at the whole EPA data strategy, but really focus in on the science, the science side. So the Office of Research and Development strategies specifically. Talk a little bit about where the agency is, but primarily we'll be um, talking about the Office of Research and Development. 
So as Jeff said, um, my role uh, currently is the um, data architect for EPA's Office of Research and Development. Um, I do um, uh, participate on the um, EPA Data Governance Council, um, which is led by our CDO, our Chief Data Officer, which is Richard Allen. Um, we have a lot of other um, work groups that we're involved in with open science and, and other things as well. And one of um, our chief goals is to make sure that our data strategy aligns with the agencies. Um, we are the group within EPA that does the most of the scientific research. We do have program offices and regions that do some as well, um, but we have the, uh, the bulk of the science in our in our organization. And um, a lot of talk about all of the different memos and, and acts and things. Um, we're really focused in um, ORD and the agency right now on meeting the requirements of the Nelson memo. Um, so specifically making the standalone cleared ORD data publicly accessible. And that would be not associated with the publication, which was what the Holdren memo required. And we're doing that already. Um, and then the second piece is removing the embargo period on the publications, which is where the agency is focused right now. So some of the types of data in, in um, our office as all scientific data related to the environment. So um, I know these uh, kind of overlap, but wanted to be um, you know, a little bit specific in certain things. Of course, laboratory field data, sensor data, um, we have some citizen science, high throughput, high throughput computational toxicology, model outputs, um, and of course, reusing existing data and geospatial or remotely sensed data. Our customers are um, pretty much everybody <laughs> within our agency, other program offices like the Office of Air and Water in our, our 10 regions and also scientists outside of EPA, other government agencies and academia, and of course the general public. So some of the challenges that we've been facing within, um, within EPA uh, are similar to what I heard from um, USGS, I believe, and, and USDA, um, storing and sharing the large data sets. So right now we are able to um, easily, relatively easily, mint DOIs and uh, make sure we can um, store and share uh, data, data sets up to one gigabyte, sometimes more four or five, um, I'm sorry, gigabyte, four or five gigabytes. Um, and, and, and that we're pretty good on. We're currently looking at a solution for hundreds of gigabytes that we hope will, will pan out, and that's more at the agency level. Um, but we really are um, kind of struggling for a solution for the, the terabyte to, to petabyte byte range. Um, there is one solution with Amazon Web Services um, that we uh, are that we have in place, um, but it's it's kind of a two-way street, and um, they can choose to uh, publish that data or not. So um, it's something that we still need to get our arms around. Another um, task is to make sure that we're uh, minimizing the effort on the scientist's part as much as possible. Our scientists like to do science. They don't, um, you know, want to be spending uh, all of their time trying to, um, you know, put things in systems and, and manage things. Uh, we need to make it as easy as possible for them, even though data is part of the research life cycle and data management is part of that. We really um, need to try to make it as easy as possible. And we also are looking at um, our data review requirements. Right now, it's it's inconsistent in terms of our data review for our higher um, priority research and uh, high visibility research. Um, the data review requirements are fairly clear and consistent, but not everything else. So we need to establish and implement more consistent requirements. In terms of our data strategy, and this again is for just our Office of Research and Development, and we are just focused on the most recent um, Nelson memo at this point, um, really increasing awareness, enhancing access, and bolstering analytics, um, following the FAIR principles, making sure that those analytical tools are, are really close to where the data are so that it's um, uh, readily available for the scientists. 
In terms of our phases of work, um, we have completed the, the planning phase and the proof of concept phase. Um, we are currently in the foundational phase, so we are not quite to the implementation phase yet. Um, and our, our hope is that we will um, get there in, uh, by December 31st, 2025. And as part of the foundational phase, we're currently developing um, guidance for the uh, data catalog entries within ORD, establish some common language and definitions, and of course do some training and staffing, enhancing our data focus, and looking into um, metrics and evaluation procedures. We're also evaluating those key technical issues, you know, trying to get our um, head around the data storage and the dissemination of large data sets and also the data review process. Um, our training will probably be in collaboration with EPA's Data Governance Council. Um, ours will obviously focus more on the science, scientific data management. And then we'll, we have some internal systems that currently support the research lifecycle. And so we will be um, looking at, at those system modifications to facilitate this, the data storage review and dissemination. So right now, um, everything is going to the epa.gov slash data website. Um, it's in the process of being redesigned, but everything should be accessible from there in the near future. And these were the questions to the other agencies that we had, and you could probably guess them from my presentation. How are you handling large data sets? What do your data review procedures look like prior to public release? And um, what actions have you taken toward removing the embargo period? Um, so that's it for me. And next we have, well, thank you very much, Anne. Everyone's keeping on time. And next we have Joel Scott from NASA. He's program executive for Earth Science Data Systems Chief Science Data Office. Just a moment. Share the right one. And We'll start on the first slide. It's a good place to start. Hi, I'm Joel Scott. I'm the program executive for Earth Science Data Systems. Thank you, Leslie and Megan, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here at ESIP. This is my first ESIP in person, and I'm so glad to see all of you and to be here. So as mentioned, I work with um, Sarita. She is the lead program executive for Earth Science Data Systems, and we both report to Kevin Murphy, who is the Chief Science Data Officer at NASA Headquarters, and his deputy, Katie Bain. So hopefully those are some names maybe some of you are familiar with or have heard in the past. Uh, but that's who we are and, and what we're kind of looking at here. So in terms of what types of data NASA has, well, when you think about NASA Earth data, NASA is a space agency, so we have satellites, and we're very proud of our Earth fleet. We have 26 assets on orbit with 11 more in formulation. And the neat thing I really love about this cornucopia diagram here is the colors indicate the stage these missions are in. And look at all those in the middle that are in blue. That means they're in extended operations. That means they have outlived their design life, and they're continuing to collect really, really valuable data about our home planet. And so that is the legacy that we are building upon in Earth Science Data Systems. If Data Systems does our job right, everyone else can just do theirs. So we're an enabler. We're really helping to set up the science community as well as decision makers and stakeholders to be able to achieve their important missions. And that's our mission. So let's talk about what we do in terms of data distribution. You can look at this robust heritage of satellite missions. That is where the bulk of our data does come from. Yes, we also cover everything from surf to turf and even below that into the ocean. Um, but the vast majority of our data is, is satellite data. And so uh, we have 72 petabytes of data. So when I hear some of my other agency counterparts talking about petabytes and terabytes, let's have a conversation. Um, we have 72 petabytes of data of Earth observations currently. And just last year, we distributed more than 3.3 billion data products to over 1.7 million distinct users. So again, those are big numbers. And uh, honestly, this chart goes further back, but it's one of these things that you really need a log plot to look at effectively. But you can see our data volumes are growing and what we're distribu distributing is also growing. So that is one of the big challenges that we're facing. Um, and like I mentioned, 
The Earth is, is really a system of systems. We have a system of satellites to look at different things from different perspectives, and that gives us a variety of data. So there's not really a one size fits all when it comes to Earth observation data at NASA. And you can see here, this is the popularity of the data, uh, data holdings that we serve out, and land data is very popular. That makes sense for humans. We live on land. Land's important for agriculture. It's important for air quality. It's important because it's our home. It's important for a lot of different reasons. It's important for carbon and biomass. But also, very also equally important if we're thinking about carbon and biomass is the ocean. And that's also one of our most popular data, data sets of products that we distribute as well as the atmosphere. People care about the air we breathe, they care about the weather we look at, they care about all that good stuff. Um, and I do want to also point out, there's other ones, cryosphere, that move on further down, but I really love this last one. It's called the human dimension. I don't know if you all get, I, I, hopefully you have met Bob Chen. He was one of the initial founding members of the group. He stood up when they, they asked over lunch who all was here at the very beginning. Um, and so he is uh, still the DAC manager of the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center that NASA has, and um, he also really provides a lot of value through CDAC in connecting socioeconomic value to our Earth observations, really putting it in a human context and bringing that data to life. So I love this chart because it shows all the amazing things that you could do with Earth observations, but then also the important context that it puts it in when you start to think about what's, what does that mean to me and what does that mean to my to, to, to me and my life, as well as uh, decision makers out there who are looking at things uh, in terms of policy and regulation. NASA is a non-regulatory agency. We're a little bit different than some of our other agency counterparts you're hearing from. That means we don't set policy when it comes to regulating different industries and things. Uh, but it also means that we can set that data up into a decision maker context to allow those decision makers to come and use our data and make their decisions. So I talked about what we have currently, but this is this is the challenges that are coming up, and this is a, this is a scary plot. This one keeps me up at night. If you look over the next ten years, I know it doesn't quite go out ten years, but if you look over the next ten years, our data volumes are going to increase by tenfold. That is a big data problem. We will be have over 700 petabytes of data. We are very excited that technology has advanced to give us these satellite missions that are going to collect this incredible volume of data. However, that's a big data problem. And it really points in my mind, we need to move away from thinking of opening a file to opening a data set. How do we align our data and compute architectures in the same place so we can operate and do things efficiently and really continue to enable uh, scientists to do their work, enable application folks to do their work and put things into a decision maker context and enable people to get to the answer very quickly, to have a good user experience. So that's one of the challenges that's on our horizon. How are we looking towards adapting to this? And that is we're leveraging Earth Data Cloud. We're leveraging the commercial cloud. Two of our upcoming missions, SWAT, already on orbit, as well as NISAR, launching in January 2024, will be in the cloud end to end. We're very excited about that from data ingest to processing to archive to search, discovery, and access fully in the cloud. And that's one of our really proud achievements because I believe depends on which product you're looking at for NISAR, but those files will be about a terabyte each. And that's a lot to try to work with. And I, I challenge any of you to think about how you're gonna work with one terabyte data file. It doesn't make sense to. So we have to start thinking about these tools and services that we're building on top of those data volumes to really make this usable. It doesn't, we can build the best satellite in the world to take the best observations in the world, but if the data is not usable in a practical sense, we've failed. So that's one of the big things we're looking to. And then also our uh, ESO missions, that stands for the Earth System Observatory. So for those of you who are aware, the National Academy sets NASA's uh, and a few other agencies' priorities every 10 years with a decadal survey. The last one came out in 2017. They said, these are the things you need to look at. I'll talk more about that on uh, Friday at the closing plenary. However, the, the we have conducted a study that has said that our uh, ESO missions, there will be three and a half, four, depending on how you count, uh, will leverage a common service-based processing architecture. And that will be built on industry-based protocols and so our future missions will be going into the cloud first and foremost and natively. So that is great. The future is the cloud for NASA. Yay, we're leveraging it. We have a great team of people working on it. I see many of your faces in this room. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for the work you do. I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about our heritage data. It's great that we're moving to the cloud, but we can't orphan this huge, robust record of data that we have about Earth observations. We are facing climate challenges and as humanity and on Earth, and so therefore we want to be able to look at a climate data record. So that is our heritage data sets. We want to make sure we don't orphan those on on-prem hardware. We want to make sure they're in the same kind of place and environment where our future missions are going, and that really does enable that next generation of science. So that's, that's some of the strategies we have moving forward. Uh, and I do just want to give a shout out that almost half of our Earth data has been migrated to the cloud, over 33 petabytes, and we have over 2,500 collections that are in Earth Data Cloud. So major props to the team, the, the Earth Data ecosystem that has made this happen. Now, so that's the big data. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you. Uh, that is the big data challenge. This is the other fun piece. And we've talked about things like the, the Nelson memo and the Holdren memo. And uh, 
it really it, it underscores and points to open science and the importance of open science. And I'm hoping you've all have seen this this little open science wheel. If not, I'll give it a high level perspective. I hope I hope open science isn't a new concept to anyone in this room. If you're here, it shouldn't be. Um, but I just want to talk briefly for about about what that means at NASA in terms of it means uh, broadening and diversifying our communities. It means making science more accessible, making data more accessible, making it interoperable, making it uh, reproducible and transparent. Those are the core tenets of open science. And you know, that's not really anything new. If you think about it, the scientific process is about transparency. What's the method section in your paper for? It's the boring section we all skim over, but it is important because it tells you what you did and how you got to your answer. That's exactly what open science is trying to underscore, but we have changed how we do science over the years. We do more software, we do more coding, we do more publications, and all of those things are important to open up as well, because that's how you make it transparent. That's how you make it so that somebody else can build upon the science that we're enabling. And we want to continue to enable these user communities to do that. And so it, if this sounds like change, it is a little bit, because yes, NASA has been making data open and accessible since 1994 for freely available. That's great. That's a great heritage to start at, but it's more than just data. It's, it's software, it's publications, it's everything that we do, and all of this has evolved through the years. And we don't really want to do this in um, isolation or in a vacuum. We want to be able to leverage our community partners. I'll wrap it up, all right, thank you. Um, so I'll move quickly through this here. We're leveraging our community partners. We're not doing an isolation. As you hear from other agencies, the uh, 2023 is a year of open science. There's 16 others that are participating in this. Check it more out at open.science.gov. What NASA is doing specifically is looking at the Nelson memo, the Holdren memo. We talk to the lawyers, we talk to the community of science practitioners, we talk to our chief information officer, and we revise our science mission data policy, which effectively touches on mission data, science data, it touches on research software and mission software, it touches on publications and uh, science workshops and meetings. Um, and so all three of those things are revised and they've been updated, um, and that uh, these things will be considered in the review of proposals so that's how we're moving it forward. Now at NASA, we believe we're not going to ask or force somebody to do something we're not prepared to help equip you to do. So we have resources. Best way to start is go to earthdata.nasa.gov. We have all the different resources for you, whether you're a data uh, a processor provider, whether you are a proposer looking for funding from NASA. We have our open science data management plan, the DMP, the OSDMP, if you've heard of that. So there's templates, resources provided. We're trying to make sure that we equip you all to be able to engage with open science as we move into the future. And I'll end with my last slide. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. This is NASA Earth. It's your home, but it's our mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. So the slides and the links and everything are there in the folder. Thanks for that was a lot of information. <laughs> Take a deep breath. And we are moving to our next speaker. Monica Youngman, who is Data Stewardship Division Chief at NOAA NCEI. Stand by, stand by. Oh. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. <laughs> Hold on, make an announcement quick. <laughs> My announcement is um, if you are on Slido and you look at the Q&A tab, you'll be able to see some questions that have been seeded there and you can go ahead if you want to give some thumbs up on those I'm or ask confused. another question. Change Sorry, everybody. What in the world? Okay. This one. Yeah, no. Yeah, like We've please talk in this your mouth. Formats of whatever the presentations are in and on the computer, on the cloud. Are we sharing screen right now? We're not sharing screen. <laughs> He quit. Megan has done many things. Share screen. I actually literally can't do this. Can you please do it? <laughs> it has defeated me. Share screen. We go to presenter view. Don't look. 
show presenter view. And we minimize. Then we go here. Then we share. So share screen. Screen view. Then we hover over PowerPoint and select choose this one. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone who helped set this up and, and for the um, conveners here. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you today about uh, NOAA's uh, data strategy and perspective here. So my name is Monica Youngman, and I'm the chief of the data stewardship division at NCEI. And so I work very closely uh, with the uh, NOAA CDO, as well as the uh, data leadership across uh, NOAA. So I'm pleased to be here representing a large group of people at uh, NOAA who actually does and promotes this work. So NOAA Open Science is built on open data. So it's absolutely fundamental to what NOAA does. And so we have a NOAA data strategy that is actually three years old this month. It was released in July of 2020. And so we've really uh, launched into the implementation phase, um, and we really see this uh, data strategy as fueling NOAA open science. And so you'll see the relationship between uh, the data strategy tenants and what the NOAA Science Advisory Board uh, really, th their report recommendations. Um, so with the data strategy, we're really focused on aligning uh, data management leadership, uh, identifying the, the govern and, and manage uh, data strategically, and sharing data as openly and widely as possible, promoting data innovation, um, and engaging stakeholders. And so in this presentation, I'll focus on our implementation uh, for the first two, um, particularly, and, but we are doing the implementation in all of these areas and, and would love to get your feedback. So another way to look at the NOAA data strategy is how this links in with the NOAA strategic goals of climate ready nation, equity, and the new blue economy. So you'll see in each of these three areas highlighted in blue here, the call out of data and how that is critical. So providing primary authoritative source for climate products and services, providing equitable access to our products and services, and then creating value added data driven economic opportunities and solutions in the new blue economy. So data is really fundamental uh, to what we are doing and, and trying to promote a, a with NOAA's uh, mission and products and services. So just to overview the scope of uh, NOAA data and our customers. So we at NOAA, we cover the gamut of from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the sun and everything in between. So these you can see in the circles, uh, the number of categories, oceans, coasts, fisheries, climate, satellites, uh, data and weather. And so these the images here are just uh, some examples of those different data sets, but by no means represents the, the full breadth of NOAA data. So we, it's not only a lot of data from a lot of different platforms, you know, from satellites, from um, uncrewed systems, you know, collecting oceanographic data, uh, you know, from LIDAR and aircraft and all these different platforms um, that are collected across our line offices within NOAA. So each of these have you know, a direct or primary user base um, but the use and integration of these data with each other uh, is really critical um, and is, it's really important to make sure that all these data are broadly accessible, um, independently understandable, and then reuse, reusable, not only within NOAA, but externally across sectors, communities, and generations. So what are we doing within NOAA to really achieve that? Um, and so, uh, as part of our NOAA data strategy, uh, we formed the NOAA Data Governance Committee. So if you're familiar with NOAA's Environmental Data Management Committee, the EDMC, the EDMC evolved into the NOAA Data Governance Committee. And so this is chaired by the NOAA uh, Chief Data Officer, but then we have representation from every line office with an Assistant Chief Data Officer. And so these folks really form the core of that uh, leadership uh, within NOAA. So that first step was to establish uh, this group and, uh, as people have mentioned, with the Evidence Act, making sure that we're expanding our scope from that environmental focus to all NOAA data. Uh, I'll touch a little bit more on developing and promoting data policies and practices, uh, which is a recent development. And finally, we're currently looking at how do we want to measure performance 
and how do we want to continue to adapt as, as we move forward. So another way to, to look at the roles, uh, data roles across NOAA is each of our line offices uh, is in this, around this circle. And in the middle here, we have that goal of open and fair data. So we have the NOAA data strategy. We also have a NOAA policy that is currently in, in review of, of being formally approved. And then a handbook, a data um, handbook that is going to replace the environmental uh, procedural directives. And so that is, internally published, waiting for that policy to be formally published so we can release that. Now, across NOAA then, we have this data governance committee that links all these line offices that I mentioned, but then we have the leadership across NOAA and all the line offices, program managers in every line offices, as well as those data producers and stewards that we need to be able to connect to really fully meet this vision. We also have cross line office programs such as the National Centers for Environmental Information that currently uh, stewards over 55 petabytes of data. So we're with uh, NASA on that one, on, on large data. Uh, we also have the NOAA Central Library that's really focused on our publications and, and the memos that um, folks have uh, mentioned, as well as our NOAA Open Data Dissemination Program. So, let's, uh, so I'm going to mention the handbook. Um, and so this is our, our first baseline of what are those policies and directives that we want to promote across NOAA to be able to meet the NOAA data strategy and have that be able to evolve uh, as you know, memos get updated and are released. And so recognizing that NOAA is a very diverse agency, we wanted to be able to provide one comprehensive uh, direction um, while making sure that's measurable, flexible, and a living document so that we can keep responding to this. So we are still um, we're working on that last measurable piece, um, but otherwise we have this uh, full draft document that's updated uh, for the Evidence Act. And uh, we also have a group that's specifically looking at the memos that were mentioned um, and how we want to update this to include uh, the, the recent um, information there. So what are some of the challenges, and I'd add here, opportunities that we have uh, for data sharing and publication? So across NOAA, we're, I, I distilled this down into four areas. Uh, so the first really is providing that integrated discovery and access to our diverse data. Uh, so we really want to be able to provide that integrated experience so you don't have to go to you know, five different line office sites to find NOAA data, that you can really bring those satellite data and fishery stock assessments and oceanographic data together to drive decision making. So we are focusing on the evolving the NOAA data catalog, metadata standards, and really exploring cloud technologies to be able to link those data. Second, uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, exploring how we want to use and support uh, third party data. So it's really important to know to be able to leverage commercial data, uh, crowdsource data, you know, some of those, those data sets that are not generated within NOAA, but that are really critical to our mission work. We also want to make sure that uh, external groups that are leveraging NOAA data are really using um, the appropriate sources and using that authoritative information. A uh, part of this, uh, I think that was mentioned earlier, is data licensing and making sure we have clear documentation. The last two here, uh, improving data discovery, access, and user engagement with cloud technology. So migrating our end-to-end -end processes, and then ensuring connections of data and publication, again, uh, linked with the memos that were mentioned. So finally, uh, questions for the community and for my uh, fellow agencies. Um, really, we'd love feedback on how can we improve uh, NOAA's uh, delivery of data uh, for that broad use and reuse. Um, so these are a number of different areas that you can uh, read on the slide and, and some questions so we'd love to be able to get that feedback and really build that into our implementation of our NOAA data strategy uh, in the backup for your reference later i do have a list of, of references and links um, to things like our our internal NOAA. we call it the par memo public access for research results so thank you Thank you very much, Monica. And now for our final speaker, Karen Sender will get to take a little bit of a deeper dive. I think I've learned a lot about the structure of these other agencies and how there's a lot of structure. So let's now look at um, one part of NOAA, and this will also give you a preview 
Uh, I got it. Open Chrome. Open Chrome. This one? No. <sighs> okay, don't worry. So we got it. You got it. It's this. in downloads. It's in downloads. Um, we can just download it again. Let's go up one level. It needs and to open in Chrome. Share the screen. Does it really need to open in Chrome? Uh, we use arrows instead of spacebar. Sorry, sorry that you get to see this as well, but it's part of the excitement of um, watching <laughs> sessions. Oh, go on. I just. Okay, so. <laughs> Please welcome oh, Karen God. Sender. Thank you. Sleep. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Monica, for uh, doing the great lead-in for Noah. Because now oh, I don't have to cover most of that. <laughs> um, I'm Karen Sender. I am uh, one of those uh, Noah ACDOs. I'm for uh, the ACDO for fisheries. Uh, in my day job, besides that uh, acting position, I am the information architect for fisheries, and so I have a uh, a long history of coming to this place with this data strategy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will uh, quickly cover, because we only have a few minutes here, um, uh, what Fisheries is all about, the journey for our data uh, through... What? A little louder. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I will uh, tell you a little bit, bit about our uh, journey to get to a data strategy for fisheries. And, uh, and why this is the right time to do this, and uh, how we are moving to uh, execution, and who's going to do that work. Um, from our new uh, fisheries strategic plan just released in December, uh, the vision is uh, to the potential of our ocean ecosystems is realized using innovation and understanding of the world for the benefit of the nation. I leave the mission statement here uh, for you to read ahead, but I really uh, recommend that you read the full document. It's not that long and it is wonderful. Uh, we have uh, a broad portfolio of uh, uh, data domains at fisheries, uh, environmental uh, monitoring and climate change, very important. Uh, fishery biology stock assessment, fishery monitoring and the ever important and challenging compliance of that, uh, habitat conservation and restoration and protected species conservation, oceanographic uh, data, uh, fisheries economics and aquacultures. Our partners and stakeholders are uh, many and uh, the, uh, we uh, have to work with them very, very closely because we are both uh, supporting the environment and supporting the fishing industry. And if we uh, think about that very long, uh, you, will, uh, you will realize that we kind of have a, uh, um, a challenge in trying to meet all of the laws, reg regulations, and, uh, and still be able to uh, support uh, our environment. We have many challenges in, uh, in data and information. Uh, uh, these all may not seem immediately uh, that they are uh, challenges to our data sharing and data access, but they are foundational to it. Uh, data quality and standardization, we are so broad geographically and with all our data uh, that, uh, you know, uh, is and we have created, uh, uh, because we are so regionally centric, uh, our fisheries programs have, uh, you know, evolved as sort of standalone entities. And now we are trying to standardize our data and so that we can integrate it better. Data volume, as we've uh, said in the presentations today, how do we, uh, uh, adapt uh, to this tsunami of data that is coming toward us. I'm from Hawaii, so 
tsunami works. Uh, again, it, integrating our data and making it interoperable uh, and uh, making it accessible, but our challenges to sharing have a lot to do with how much confidential data that we have because of our uh, fishing uh, industry and because of uh, PII and BII. Uh, um, data analysis and modeling uh, with our uh, emerging technologies, everything is changing. And uh, um, the privacy and security, as I just mentioned, is, uh, is a huge challenge for us. We are still, in many cases, trying to transition from paper to electronic reporting because we have so much of the fishing industry with fishermen that uh, have, are just growing into being techni technology experts. And, uh, and uh, but this is something we have to do to speed up our reporting. And uh, very currently, we are uh, very uh, set on uh, removing technical debt uh, and replacing legacy data systems. Our journey, which I can only touch on here, but it really, really started with the first PAR uh, to get to the current data strategy that we have. You know, we, uh, it was such a challenge in trying to respond to uh, the Holdren memo uh, to be able to get our data uh, well inventoried, well documented, and accessible. And we learned so much of that, that as the federal data strategy came forth, and then uh, we were uh, knew that we had to take an, another step up, and we had a national workshop with uh, even some of our NGOs uh, and other commercial um, stakeholders and uh, people from every uh, walk of the data, from uh, data technicians and developers and IT people in a workshop, our fisheries information management modernization workshop that came up with uh, recommendations for what we can do next. And that really was the basis for our uh, evolving data strategy. With the NOAA data strategy and uh, and with a new push uh, to modernize our data governance, which we considered foundational to being, to moving from a headquarters-driven, uh, you know, data governance model to a more uh, nationally facilitated, regionally centric data governance model that has been sort of the secret sauce to us moving forward and it will continue to be. And so now here we are, we have a, a fisheries data strategy and we're already beginning on, um, to implement a, uh, a fisheries modernization plan, which you will hear more about hopefully later. Uh, we have a new fisheries data vision and this came about because we have leadership's passion now for, the, for uh, this uh, moving forward uh, with fisheries data and information. And uh, I will read this here because it's important. If you come to uh, the, the later session this afternoon, you will hear this again and, and get more information about it. But information science and technology exist together to serve our mission. Fisheries commits to creating a culture that confidently embraces a people first approach to data service and delivery by keeping information at the forefront of all that we do to optimize scientific integrity for mission success and public trust. Okay, almost there. Our fisheries data strategy is totally aligned with the NOAA data strategy. Um, we have put, uh, uh, it is just slightly different uh, areas here, but we have put data culture at the top of everything because if you were to not do anything else except the objectives in the data culture, uh, you would make a uh, you would have people more passionate, more able, more skilled, more data literate to be able to want uh, to do all of the other things that have seemed a challenge to them in uh, and uh, making their data uh, you know fair and high quality. Uh, so you can see that there. 
why do we think this can go uh, happen now? We are moving from a sense of urgency to a seizing opportunity. And, uh, and we have to go. Don't worry, but <laughs> then you can read with me, my dear. Uh, <laughs> You know, of all of the things that were mentioned today about a par and the federal and commerce and NOAA data strategies, all the insights we've received, the teams that we have in place, and especially the fisheries uh, open scapes cohorts that we are doing and our leadership commitment and being able to have a uh, the tandem uh, development of both a, a data strategy and a modernization plan. And I could just leave, end it right there. Uh, if you would love to go to the final, I'll let you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, um, who, how we're final. gonna get this done? The final, <laughs> final. final. <laughs> I am. Oh, that final. Thing. <laughs> yes, it is very important. The final uh, note here, because uh, in moving to execution, we would like to uh, invite you to the um, the session at four o'clock for the fisheries. Vis uh, data vision, uh, and it is about this uh, fisheries modernization implementation strategy. So, uh, you know, come and learn more. We can dive deeper into this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for sharing that information. The goal of this session was first and foremost, information sharing between the agencies and with anyone else who wanted to learn more about what is going on in the different places. ESIF is a great place to accomplish this type of discussion. And now we have a, some time to make sense of what we heard and also hear a little bit from each speaker. I know we have questions here. Let me just say, Megan and I envisioned this as the beginning of the discussion, and we definitely aren't going to get to all of the great questions and discussion today. Um, hopefully we'll find a place to continue these discussions and you're all invited to come um, learn more. So at this point, I'm going to navigate to Slido. And thank you to those of you who saw that there was a question in there about in your specific role, um, what are some barriers, but um, I think I'm going to move so we can all be on the same page and process what just happened. Why don't we move to the what is one thing you are taking away or one thing you're going to do as a result of this session, just so everyone can think about that themselves while we pass the mic around to our speakers and also hear from them about what they are going to take away. And I know this is a little bit hard. You have to process everything that you heard, but we're just asking for one um, one idea so we can all get inspired is there what can we do now that we've seen all of this information and i'm i'm going to invite viv um, kind of go in the order of the speakers and speakers if you could maybe do one minute or so of something you may be taking away oh, viv we can see you on the screen here and you're unmuted so please go ahead Okay, well, I thought this was a fantastic grouping of presentations and I really appreciated everything that I heard. Um, I think uh, some of the takeaways, uh, <laughs> I think this is great that this is the start of a conversation because you know we can work in silos, but it's much better if we don't and work across agencies. We had, I just saw a lot of similarity um, between what the various um, bureaus and agencies were trying to accomplish through their data strategies and very sort of similar uh, mission visions even. And so so anyway, I think promoting uh, collaboration and continuing to share how we're implementing, how we're doing business that allows us to, um, you know, publicly share our data is a thing that we need to continue and, and work with. So that's one one major takeaway that I had. 
Great, thank you, Viv. Uh, if we could pass the mic to Cindy in the room, please. The question is, what is one takeaway or thing that you will do as a result of this session? We're all trying to, what can we do okay. with all this information? Okay, um, I'm going to get back to an idea I had a while back, which was to gather together all the agencies that are combining Evidence Act activities and public access activities and maybe have a support group or therapy <laughs> session or something, uh, because, you know, it's, it's a challenge for the reasons that you've heard today, but it's also, you know, we can make progress together. Thank you, Cindy. Um, next is online, and. Yeah, I, I just have to say, I, I'm really impressed with all of the agencies and the work that everyone is doing. And the first thing I'm going to do is to share all of these presentations with folks back in, in EPA. And um, I, I won't be ashamed to say, steal whatever we can, <laughs> um, because it's been, uh, obviously, there's there's a lot of thought that has been going on for a long time with, with some of these these agencies and I feel that, you know, we have a lot to learn. So um, that's number one. And um, I did see a question about um, the regulatory uh, side of things. And I'll take that back also to our chief data officer who's just directly um, working with that piece. Um, so hopefully more conversations to come and, and more uh, collaborations to come. Thank you very much, and and yeah, you are invited to come up, and they'll be able to see you also if you stand right here, Joel. I was just going to move up here because I realized with the microphone in front of the speaker, that was a feedback nightmare. Um, <laughs> oh, the camera, so people can see me too. Hey. Um, so it's a great question, and honestly, I, I feel like in the federal government, we, there's never a shortage of fire drills for us to respond to, and that's a lot of what I'm, I'm hearing we, we do. And so there's a Nelson memo, there's a Holdren memo, there's all these different priorities that we need to jump to and respond to, and those are important. Um, but I also like to challenge us to pause for a moment and, and be a little more visionary in future thinking. How can we prepare instead of react? And then, I mean, I, I, I really want to spend more time talking about the year of open science, but I also would challenge folks in the room, what are you doing after that? I mean, it's, it's, we've been doing open science before. This is really a moment for us to stop and pause and say, let's really think about what we're doing and be intentional about how we move forward. But it doesn't just stop when that year ends. It's thinking about, all right, so we're responding to Nelson, we're responding to Holdren, we're having these strategies, we're making these policies. What are we actually doing to continue that adoption and that uptake to enable our communities of users out there as we move into the future? Um, and so that's one I think that I think I'm taking away from here is I, I we need to make sure that those resources we're providing for open source science, for data access and accessibility, continue into the future beyond you know just responding to these memos and beyond just supporting open source uh, year of open science. If I could, I forgot to say one thing, which is if you're not a Slido person and you don't feel like typing into Slido, the same questions are in the Google document. If you'd like to contribute that way, and now we will hear from Monica. So, of course, going near the end, people have taken a lot of what I was going to say, but I think just building on um, what people have already said, I think getting a network, so I think reaching out to the other presenters, I think is a great first step, um, and coming together to not only build connections between our data strategies, but, you know, uh, building on, on Joel, what you said in terms of what's next is how do we actually connect our data across these agencies, because I think that is where we're going to get a lot uh, of that value and, and the benefits. So. We didn't practice this part. <laughs> um, to follow up at the end, and everyone has said the great things, but uh, I want to follow up also on Cindy's comments. Cindy and I were talking earlier this week just about forming a, a sort of support group for the ACDOs. But one of the biggest successes we've had at fisheries is communities of practice. And actually, even our governance committee is a network. Every team, the, the open science uh, community with uh, is a team and a network and build more communities of practice 
and uh, and this is one. And I look forward to talking to all of the people that talked about their data strategies. That was one of my frustrations: is when building the data strategy, trying to l reach out to all the government agencies and look at their data strategies. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. And now we can look at some of the ideas that came in from the room. I will scroll to the bottom because that's the, the quick, the quick trigger people. Okay. So what are the things, some of the things that we can do now that we've had this first conversation? Share presentations with your relevant, um, you know, higher ups, whether that be the chief data officer or others in your organizations, um, takeaways that, oh, maybe we need more staff to actually do these things. Okay, speakers, you may be contacted, which is part of the reason we invited you here. Thank you. Um, okay, yes, bedtime reading, agency strategies, try to do some coordination. Megan and I will do some thinking about what are some venues maybe in ESIP where we can Continue this. Okay, let's just admit it. We are all struggling with the Holdren memo ramifications. Um, please do look at the shared links that are in the folders and the presentations. So hopefully you have some ideas, whether you're actually writing a data strategy or just something else in your work that you can take away something from these ideas. Okay, nobody talked about confidential data or sensitive data. That's a big issue. So maybe that can be a add on a, a future conversation. If there's sensitive data that may is either PII or something about say like species or plants that something could happen to them if we let that data out there. Okay, we have a developer here maybe that the agencies could, fork or um, maybe not not definite not put their plan on GitHub. everyone put your, your plan on github and we're going to fork the action plans or we could do it some other way so take it and modify it a little bit for yourself like open source software okay there's other working groups so that was another question do you know other groups that would be interested in this information if so um, let us know, no, let the speakers know there's a place in the Google Doc if there's other groups you want us to reach out to. Okay, this one was long. Let's see. Seems to be an assumption that all this stuff must be custom built, but if federal agencies are unable to identify an existing software solution, they may choose to develop, they may choose. Okay, so they don't have to custom develop, but everyone loves to custom develop for their own needs. So I don't know if anyone wants to follow up on that, but that's what I think the gist of that is. There may be custom development, but maybe we can share some of our solutions. Okay, so thank you for these ideas. Sorry, if you didn't have a quick draw, then um, I'm trying to just move us along a little bit. So we're going to hide these meeting controls. What, okay, what was the funny one? Fish puns. Was it the fish puns one? Okay. You know, some people miss the fish puns like me, so I'll have to pay more attention. Okay, so let's just take a look at the Q&A, if any were voted to the top here. Um, and we will get in touch with, hopefully the Q&A are here. Nope, that's not the Q&A. We need to do it here. What? <laughs> Every, I'll share all the comments with the speakers if there's a funny one about you. I can't process that when I'm up here. Okay, so there's. let's just see at what the most upvoted ones here are. There's an invitation to EPA to join ESIP so we can more closely leverage our data expertise. Yes, we're, we're discussing it. Um, not, not my decision, but we are in discussions. Yep. 
Okay. I also want to point out there is a group on open science on the max.gov. So I don't know how many people are connected in there, um, but there's uh, quite a, a large community there that a lot of ORD, a lot of our EPA folks are tied into there as well. Great. Could you repeat which group that is on max.gov? Um, open science subcommittee, science. I can put a link somewhere. Okay. For you so, all. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> we'll share that. Okay, another comment. So I'm gonna take these top three and that will be the end. Sorry, sorry, we can't keep going. Okay, so from Eli and thank you, Eli had helped us to vision this uh, session as well. So a question again for Anne, how is EPA approaching? Okay, I don't know about this, so I'm just gonna read it out. The 2021 final rule that requires sharing data underlying regulatory decisions with regards to confidential data used yeah, that's the one I can't answer. I'll have to get back to our chief data officer on that one. Okay, yes, yeah, good. Lots of questions here. Um, and then something for us all to think about this third one, as some open science directives are viewed as a heavy lift, how do we mitigate the risk of knowledge loss via seasoned scientists opting for the private sector. Okay, shoot, I hadn't been worrying about that, but now I will also worry about federal scientists going to the private sector. Um, everyone, I know that we had a lot of questions and maybe your question didn't get answered, but I hope that you had a chance to learn something and think about how it might affect you and share your next steps. I'm I'm not going to go all the way to the 90 minute because this was just a lot of information. I just want to thank all of our speakers and all of our attendees for coming to learn here together and thank ESIP for giving us this opportunity. Bye online people, thank you for being there.